Okay, so we've spent this time talking about what happens when we apply a load to something. We develop some kind of internal force distribution that we call a stress, but we also evoke a dimensional change. We make the thing longer. So if I end up pulling on it, it gets longer. That's the, what I want to talk about today. So if I have a bar, so let's just draw a little, little bar in here. And we're going to attach it to a wall here in the back. And if I apply a load there, and we'll say this is the y-axis, this is the x-axis, this is the z-axis. So let's assume that we're applying a load and the material is only going to be deformed elastically. So we're staying within the elastic limit of the material. So we know from Hooke's law that that strain in the x direction is going to be the stress in the x direction over the modulus of elasticity. I just rewrote Hooke's law for strain. Now notice I'm using the x subscript now. Because we're only looking at strain along the x-axis. We're not looking at strain along the y or the z-axis. Now, if it's getting longer in the x-direction, something has to be going on. The material has to be coming from somewhere. Because we can't violate the principle of conservation of matter. So in this case, we are elongating what we call longitudinally. And so longitudinally, or I'll refer to it as is usually long, so strain in the longitudinal direction. So longitudinally means that it's going to be in the axis that we're pulling on. So in this case, the longitudinal stress would be the strain in the x direction. Since the longitudinal stress is getting increased, the material has to come from somewhere. And so that material is coming from what we call the lateral direction. So the lateral direction are the two off axes. So what you'll, what I would call this would be E lat or the lateral strain. That would be the strain in the y direction and the strain in the z direction. So I go and I look at this picture. As you see, this guy, as it's getting longer along the longitudinal axis, it has to shrink in the lateral axis. So ELAT, and this would be ELONG. So obviously, there is a relationship between how the lateral strain and the longitudinal strain change. So in the early 1800s, there was a French scientist named Poisson. Uh, Poisson is the French word for fish. That is not relevant to this, this conversation, but it is brought up to me by students that do know a little bit of French. But in the 1800s, the early 1800s, he figured out that there was a constant ratio between the strains in the longitudinal direction and the lateral direction while we're within the elastic region. So while we're in the elastic region, we need, a, we need three things to be held. And that's one, that we're in the elastic region. So that's both before our yield stress, so we're still operating under the assumption that Hooke's Law is valid. Second thing we need is a homogeneous material. So what is a homogeneous material? It's the material that's all the same. It's not a mix, it's just, it's steel, it's brass, it's some kind of plastic. And the last thing that we need is an isentropic material. Sorry, isotropic material. Isentropic is a thermo... Uh, dynamic thing. Isentropic material means that it's uniform in all directions. So we've got the material, there's no pits, no voids, it's all uniform. So what we can do is mathematically we can state what Poisson's ratio is. So he didn't name it after himself. So Poisson's ratio 
is defined. Uh, we're going to continue our classical Greek education here. And so Poisson is new. So this is lowercase Greek new. You actually see this pop up again in fluids where this will be your kinematic viscosity. So it looks kind of like a V that's tilted a little bit. And so we define Poisson's ratio as the negative of the lateral strain over the longitudinal strain. And here's your box, undergrads love boxes. Uh, why is it the negative? Because one of those strains is always going to be negative. Because if I elongate along the longitudinal axis, then I'm going to shrink in the lateral axis. Because that material that I'm adding on the longitudinal axis has to come from the two side axes. So it gets smaller. And they get smaller equally. And so negative of the lateral strain, so the off-axis strain, divided by the longitudinal strain. It's a pretty simple concept to put together. Typically, you're going to be looking at things that are going to be less than 0.5. So, especially materials, you will see this, this value runs between 0 and 0.5. Can it be above 0.5? Now, there's some really elastic materials that exhibit really weird behavior that can get up there and whatnot but what we're not we're typically not going to see that when we're looking at our materials with these normal regular materials like i said when you get into this uh, viscoelastic materials and these are materials that they change their behavior based on how much stress is placed on them uh, one of the best examples would be the the collagen in your knee that whole web work is a very viscoelastic material and it changes but we're not going to be worrying about that so uh, homogeneous isentropic materials that we deal with are always going to be less than 0.5 what happens if i calculate out poisson's ratio and it's above one which does happen occasionally what does that mean well that means that you've inverted your longitude and your latitude on your equation because you're always going to get less than 0.5 if you end up getting above 0.5 that just means you've got the two of those backwards and you need to go back and finish fix them. When you do this in the lab, that actually happens quite a bit. When you plot out the, uh, the lateral strain, the longitudinal strain, because you will do a you will do a chart, you'll do a graph, you'll develop the line, and the slope of the line will be Poisson's ratio. And if it comes out to be over one, what you've done is you've inverted those two. In fact, this is the best way, if you can, to find Poisson's ratio, because when you're looking at the slope of the line, you're averaging out all the errors that could be locally in the little ones. I mean, if you need to, you can find it at one point, but when you look it up in the material properties chart, when you look it up in a book, that's what you're seeing is the slope of many, many tests that they've done. Okay, and so that's the basics of Poisson's ratio.